Uh, welcome everyone to this session on the good, bad, and the ugly of uh, ML in network systems. Applying ML to a problem needs no real motivation or push in 2018. We're seeing a huge surge in, in, in developing ML techniques for a lot of large-scale uh, network systems. And with the huge amount of data and computing power available, this actually makes it quite feasible. And, uh, and of course, Microsoft has been in the forefront of you know, applying data at huge scales to, to you know, large-scale systems issues. However, there is a, a growing voice, maybe even the silent majority of voices in the systems and networking community that is clamoring for more principled solutions. You know, they're concerned that we're building solutions without quite understanding what they actually do. This session in, in, intends to wade right into this, this storm. Uh, you know, what are the network systems for which ML is appropriate? The fact that we have built systems are built with abstractions, does it make it, you know, more amenable to using black box ML-based techniques? And uh, finally, do we even need full understanding of the solutions as the, the so-called traditionalists uh, insist? Uh, to discuss all these questions and more, uh, we have a panel, uh, 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 you know, of, of, of researchers in this space, and uh, we'll start with Balaji Prabhakar from Stanford. Balaji is a professor at Stanford. His research is uh, largely in the space of uh, self-programming networks, uh, particularly in the context of cloud computing platforms and uh, data centers. Balaji uh, has a long list of awards, but I won't list all of them, but I would just note the, that, that he's won the Erlang Prize from the Applied Probability Society and the Rollo Davidson Prize from the University of Cambridge. And uh, he's a Sloan Fellow, IEEE, and ACM Fellow as well. Look. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to take a position, and uh, my main thesis is that uh, on the good, bad, ugly side, I'm going to say it's good. Okay. Uh, what's ugly and sometimes can be bad is the hype, but in, in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with ideas. Uh, is how we end up uh, using them, or worse, uh, how we end up making a bigger deal out of them. Uh, so my, some of my background is uh, theoretical, and so the scientific modeling process always goes on a knife edge. Uh, there are a few theorems that give universality, uh, but other than, that, other than that, things tend to be uh, for tractability. We make some models, and uh, they work by and large. Uh, there's some well-known combinations, like uh, linear systems go with Gaussian noise really well, and that goes with quadratic cost functions really well. That's a fairly large amount of optimal control theory. Stochastic control all runs on those three assumptions. Um, people have tried relaxing any one of these, and it's not been easy. Okay? Uh, nobody's heard from those people who tried to relax these assumptions. Uh, they've gone off into the woods and never come back. Uh, similarly, in networking, we know there is, again, a Markovian assumption wedded to poison arrivals and exponential services. Small variations, but otherwise, by and large, that's a successful modeling class. Uh, what happens when we leave this world of, uh, you know, where modeling assumptions uh, don't quite work or you, you now, now want to capture something in more exact detail? That is where uh, lots of data in these days, and when combined with uh, neural networks and ML, can actually help. Okay. So it helps us to ca capture something that's actual uh, an actual system where the modeling assumptions uh, have got us some distance, but now uh, we want to be more exact than that. Okay, what that does is it does it does certainly leave the burden of understanding upon us, and uh, I'm in, I'm okay if first we get success and then understanding. Usually we prefer understanding first and then success. Then we can declare success correctly. Uh, but you know, people have had observations that for which theories have come later. That's fine. Uh, it's worth just saying, sharing an anecdote with Niels Bohr, uh, about Niels Bohr or involving him. Uh, he had a scientific friend visit with him at some summer uh, home that he had in the mountains somewhere, and banged on the door frame of this house. There was a horseshoe, which is well known as a good luck charm. So the scientific friend said, surely, you know, Professor Bohr, you don't believe in this superstition. And he said, well, I don't believe in it but they say it works whether you believe in it or not, okay? 
it's not a bad thing to keep in mind for the topic of this panel. Okay. Um, I want to take two specific uses for neural networks. Uh, first is so-called function approximation. They're well known to have the property of approximating functions. Uh, Two-layer neural networks are universal. That's a long ago theorem of Andrew Barron's. And second is that uh, when combined with hardware of the uh, GPU, TPU type, this ability to approximate function can vastly speed up. Uh, it's very useful for us in networking, uh, speed up computations. I'm going to give you some examples. One example uh, supporting both is from self-programming networks. So I'll tell you what that is and briefly also tell you some work I've been doing with the student of Sachin Kati's Mani Kotaru uh, and also Gordon Weststein, who's a colleague who specializes in VR uh, computer vision. And uh, finally, uh, I was at a Simons Institute program in Berkeley last season, last spring, uh, you know, the, the one that just went by. And we had a, a physicist from Caltech who's involved in uh, elementary particle physics in this Large Hadron Collider. And they also use neural networks in pretty much the same way that I'm going to uh, describe it, for the same reasons also. So self-programming networks is a research program at Stanford. Um, uh, Mendel Rosenblum and I are uh, working on it together with a bunch of students. And uh, the, the infer and learn is in, are in blue because that's where we've used some neural networks. Um, and so, again, one slide, what, what is self-driving, uh, self-programming networks? Um, so think of a self-driving car. You take a plain old car. If you add sense and control to it, then it becomes Stanley, the self-driving car. This is Sebastian thrown on the, on the, on the trunk, on the, so on the, on the hood. Um, similarly, we would take a plain old data center, and our focus is on data centers. So in other words, I'm not advo advocating what we're doing for wide area internet yet because there's some particular assumptions we made. And you add sense and control to it, and we want to use that to you know, form self-programming networks. Uh, I don't have time to tell you more about it, where we sense, how we control. Uh, it's mostly a NIC-based approach. And uh, what that allows us to do is to run some new applications that couldn't run on the old, plain old data center. So it allows us to run this, because it has additional functionality, like a very accurate timestamping of the service, and so on. So in this world, neural networks, I want to get to it, comes in the following way. Uh, we've taken a sort of tomography type approach to measurement, i.e. you look at uh, ingress and egress times of packets at NICs. When you have this for a whole bunch of packets, you're in the world of solving simultaneous linear equations to determine from the total time how much time was spent in each box. Okay. Um, the algorithm for this is Lasso, one, the one we use. So you're looking at the total delay D. A is the adjacency matrix that decides what path the packet took. Q is the queuing delays that the switches it's visiting. N is the noise. Uh, noise is variable violence, nick time stamping inaccuracies, and various things like this. Uh, we worked on this and tested it in the Google's 40G testbed, the internal production network, and various other places, uh, including data center at Stanford. But this is the algorithm. So given the end-to-end -end delay, estimate uh, individual queue, queuing delays over a certain interval. Um, this works, um, but it's slow. The lasso algorithm scales poorly with the size of the network. Um, there are fast implementations of lasso, but even, even so, uh, we want to see if we can just teach a neural network to do this. What that means is, uh, take an algorithm like lasso. It has its input-output map that defines a function and uh, take the input output pairs, lots and lots and lots of them, and train a neural network with it. You have to remember, after all, we're just inverting noisy linear equations, OK? If there was no noise in the equation was well determined, the inverse is just another linear system, OK? Uh, so you expect, a priori, the neural network should have a good chance. So it turns out just a two-layer is completely as shallow as you can get a neural network of the basic uh, ReLU type uh, is good enough. So what's the result look like? Um, on the top is reconstruction accuracy. This is the first chart. Uh, you can have uh, different size networks. Lasso has a uh, root mean squared error, which is, you can think of it as how many packets, like roughly three full-sized 1,500 byte packets, roughly. That's the error. The second column is neural networks trained with ground truth when you have it available. And the third is neural network trained with the output of Lasso itself. Okay. 
And so, as you can see, it's pretty accurate. That is, there's not much loss of accuracy. But the killer is the second thing. Lasso scales poorly, as I said before. So every millisecond's worth of data takes you more than a millisecond, depending on the size of the network, it can get as bad as a second. But uh, if you train a neural network, you can stick, you know, be uh, tracking time, okay? So that's an example of function approximation capability as well as hardware uh, acceleration, okay? So that's my first example. Second one is, uh, again, very briefly, even briefer than this, is um, this uh, work with uh, Mani Kotaru, uh, who's uh, Sachin's student, as I said. Um, Sachin and his students have had a theme of uh, using Wi-Fi signals for various things. In this case, it's localization. And uh, there's a VR headset that's moving. Wi-Fi signals are captured. The goal is to localize based on the signals. There's a well-known 70s, mid-70s algorithm called Music that does it. And uh, it sort of cancels the indirect path, et cetera. It, it does. Uh, but you get a 60 centimeter error, OK, when Music does the localization. Uh, in work that took money more than a year and a half because you really, it's not like off the shelf ML, it's like you have to work, wrestle with it. I actually thought he wouldn't even succeed. Maybe there's not an easy function to approximate. Uh, but he did. Um, there's a, a submission on this, it's four centimeter error, okay? And it's also really fast uh, by comparison with music. So there's an example of second, second example. And the last one is just, uh, I'm going to, I really encourage you to read it because I was quite impressed with the way the physics folks are doing it. Uh, this is from CERN. I'm happy to share this with folks who, you know, if you want the URL. So basically what happens in the sort of, you know, Large Hadron Collider is that some elementary part, some something is held over here and like some really fast thing comes and bangs it. And then stuff like muons, gluons, all these guys come out. And you have to trace the trajectory of these particles. That's their business. But the data generated is so huge that they have to censor it. They can't store everything. And it starts, the article starts by saying in the 60s, people used to pour over this, uh, you know, in the 60s, people used to pour over this uh, thing and, you know, uh, this, these images and reconstruct the trajectories to find out if they found a new elementary particle or not, like the Higgs boson type thing is showing up or not. Uh, and then, the learning revolution has just begun, and it was, it was based on sort of grid computing that was introduced in the 2000s. And what they're now doing is just, it's exactly reconstruction. So my problem of the inverse, uh, given the overall delay, find me the Q sizes, that's called an inverse problem. Uh, that is, the forward equation is D equals AQ plus N. The inverse equation is given D, find me Q. There's another inverse problem, okay? Uh, inverse problems are in MRI, all of those are inverse problems. And so there's another inverse problem, and the sort of most recent work has been about training these neural networks to just do these inverse problems and find the trajectories, okay? So what that, the equivalent of lasso for them is this sort of classical quantum mechanics laws, and then they just train them, okay? So I think it's, uh, it's hardware acceleration plus all that is beneficially used in this case as well, okay? So with that, I'll stop. The format we're hoping is that uh, if there are any burning questions, one or two, we could bring it up now. But if you have more broader questions, you know, we ask that you keep it for the panel at the end. Any quick questions while Bruce gets set up? Okay. Uh, we'll try my laptop. Yeah, while Bruce gets out of Bruce, uh, is from Duke University. His interests are in large-scale networks as well as his research. Uh, prior to that, Bruce uh, w was at Carnegie Mellon University where uh, he, he helped launch the Akamai uh, uh, CDN service. And he was the first vice president of research and development for Akamai where he continues to hold a role as vice president for research. Uh, Bruce's work has won the uh, SITCOM Networking Systems Award, um, as well as the IEEE Cybersecurity Innovation Award. Welcome. We're going to go with VGA. Got it hooked up there? Yep. 
Thank you, Ganesh. Um, <coughs> it's nice to be here. I have to say that I, I'm giving this presentation with some trepidation because I, I don't really use ML very much in my work. I tried to think of the best justification I could find for myself as a speaker, and it occurred to me that I have ML in my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a traditional systems designer. I like to uh, design big systems. Um, the biggest example is the Akamai CDN, um, large parts of which I designed. I like to try to optimize these systems. And I like to fix them. And one of the things I've uh, discovered over and over is that whenever you take measurements and look at how your system's performing, you find out that it's broken. Um, broken either not functioning correctly or, or it's just performing very poorly. And uh, there's a, a methodology that I've used many times to try to either improve systems or design systems with new capabilities that I call uh, data-driven design of network systems. And so the idea is that you look around for existing systems that are already um, deployed on a large scale and from which you can collect a lot of data, possibly data of different types. And then you, you, you think about how, how could we marry these data sets to help us evaluate new system designs, maybe for a system that does something different or that does the same thing but in a very different way. And uh, so one example of this, maybe the, the first one I was involved in was uh, there was a new system that had been developed at Carnegie Mellon um, around 2000 or so uh, for um, purely peer-to-peer -peer delivery of live or real-time video called End System Multicast. This, uh, this was not my work. Uh, it was, it was um, Hui Zhang and Sanjay Rao and, and, and several others. They won the Sigmetrics Test of Time Award for their paper describing N-System Multicast. But they didn't have a very good way of evaluating whether or not this system could really hold up under real workloads. And so one of the things we did was we gathered all the logs from, from Akamai's uh, real-time um, video delivery system. And then we used that to uh, uh, drive simulations of ESM. And the kinds of questions we were interested in were, well, when there's a massive flash crowd at the beginning of some kind of scheduled event and peers are joining and leaving rapidly, is the system stable? And, and most of the time we found that, in fact, even without the kind of dedicated infrastructure that, uh, that Akamai had deployed for its real-time streaming network, the um, ESM was, was still uh, uh, mostly successful. Let me give you a, a, another example of, of this kind of work. So here's a, a fact that maybe people don't know, but TLS certificate revocation checking is, is broken in a bad way, and here's how. Your mobile device doesn't check for certificate revocation, okay? So what this means is if, if somebody, you go to some website where you provide your password, and, and maybe you use the same password on a lot of websites, and somebody has stolen that site's private key, somehow, maybe through a bug, like the Heartbleed bug. And, and somehow they have interfered with DNS and you've gone to an imposter site. And despite the fact that the true owner of that certificate uh, has reported it as no longer valid and put it on a revocation list, uh, your device will not check for that. And I know this because I've tested all the mobile devices, Android devices, uh, iPhones, I couldn't find any example in which any device ever checked for certificate revocation. And the reason they don't is that it's too expensive. 
this one of the things I found a little frustrating this morning going to talks about formally verifying security properties, making sure your implementations of the protocols are correct and so on, is that there are these other economic reasons why whole parts of the protocol just aren't implemented. And so on mobile devices, they don't do secure, uh, certificate revocation checking because it would be too much bandwidth to download the whole list of revoked certificates. Or it would take too long to contact an OCSP server to ask, is this certificate valid? Or there's, there's new protocols like OCSP stapling, but only you know two or 3% of servers uh, are supporting that. So it's just not done. And this is a, a crying shame. So we started thinking about, is there data out there that would make it possible to solve this problem? And it is not difficult to find the list of all the revoked certificates, because they're on these certificate revocation lists. But what's harder to find is a list of all the valid certificates. Until recently, when Google was so uh, annoyed that Symantec had uh, made some fake certificates that they launched something called certificate transparency. And now uh, they, they're basically pressuring certificate authorities to put into, uh, just to like spice up my talk, I'm going to say a blockchain type of log, every certificate that they issue. And in addition to that, there's some research projects that have been going around scanning the whole uh, IPv4 address space, pulling every certificate they can from port 443. So suddenly we have a new data set we didn't have before, which is all the valid certificates. So we had the invalid ones before, and now we have the valid ones. So this suggests, by the way, this is a lot of certificates. We're, we're, we're talking about tens of millions. Um, this suggests a, a way to uh, uh, represent, in a very compact data structure, um, complete information about every certificate indicating whether it's been revoked or not. And the, the structure is called a filter cascade. So the idea is that you take all the revoked certificates and you insert them into a bloom filter. Now, that would be fine as a solution, except that it'd be really unfair if there was a false positive and some website certificate is now marked as revoked because there was a, you know, just a bad collision. So then you, you take all the non-revoked certificates and you, you, um, you ask, okay, are there any false positives? And you, for all the false positives, you create a bloom filter to hold those. And there are a lot more non-revoked certificates than revoked, so that it's important that the first level you, 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 you insert the, not, the, the revoked ones so you can have a small table but with a really small false positive rate. And then you say, okay, what about uh, revoked certificates that accidentally get marked as false positives, meaning they would be considered as non-revoked, and you make a little, okay, so you get this geometric decrease, and uh, it turns out that this filter cascade, it has 43 levels, but you only expect to do 10 hashes to look up the status of any certificate, and the whole thing only takes 1.1 megabytes to represent the precise status of every certificate. And there's a lower bound, an information theoretic lower bound of 0.77 megabytes, so you're not going to do much better. And so uh, basically, there, today there are 60 million valid certificates. That number is about 40 million higher than it was two years ago, maybe 50 million, because of Let's Encrypt. And today there, this, in September anyway, 850,000 revoked certificates, and uh, so that would take 1.1 megabytes, but actually the list changes very slowly, so you can just publish diffs, and the whole thing is only 40 kilobytes per day. Okay, so this is an example of sort of data-driven system design. You say, look, what, what's out there? Um, how could we exploit it? Now, I'm gonna say a little bit about machine learning. Um, the application of machine learning in computer networking is old. So here's a paper from a survey from 2008 that's been cited a thousand times, okay? Traffic classification. This is a, a thing people have done for a long time, trying to figure out, okay, is this an attack? Uh, it, what kind of application is running here? This is an old application. I was thinking a little bit about places where uh, you might use 
machine learning in the context of content delivery networks. So one of the things that um, Akamai tries to do is predict for each client on the internet, like a billion clients, uh, which of our servers would give best performance. And this is an example where you have multiple data sets of different character. You have past performance, you have network measurements, you have network topology information. You're trying to make a prediction. And here you could try to use machine learning. Another application is trying to figure out, is this a legitimate client? We have a lot of trouble with botnets trying to break into banking customers. Uh, so, you know, we want to develop a reputation for a client or estimate the physical location of a client. This is easy if there's some way for a client to click on the allow button to give up their location. But Akamai doesn't touch clients the same way that, say, a content provider does. And these kinds of things work best when the penalty for false positives is low. So it's OK if whatever algorithm you're using uh, does poorly um, as long as it doesn't hurt that much when you make the wrong decision. So uh, when we decide a client's suspicious, we don't ban it, but we rate limit it. Or if we decide a, a participant in our peer-to-peer -peer content delivery system, Akamai has tens of millions of clients in, in a system that does this, is suspicious, we just kick it out and say, you have to download from the CDN. Okay, okay I'll finish there. Quick questions? Both kind of uh, up, um, um, kind of like trying to say data driven and machine learning is a good thing for networking, uh, but I see there's something different uh, between you and Blagic. Since the first talk is more talking about the catalyst of success of machine learning and networking is because we have more expensive, more more complex models, right? Neural network is an example, uh, but you are more talking about the catalyst is because we have more. All of a sudden, we have more data. Right, we have more data from Akamai, or we have more data from Google. It's kind of explosion of amount of data. That that is the, the kind of driving force behind this. So, are, um, is it true that you think uh, having more data is kind of relatively more important to have more complex models? Okay, so I'm not sure I, that was exactly the point I wanted to make, but I I do like the way you summarized it. That the fact that we have more data is giving us new opportunities, new ways of designing systems. And perhaps ML is a tool that can be used uh, to help do that. That's a good point for follow up as well. Uh, in the panel, more data or is it model complexity? Uh, oh. Next up, we have uh, Dave Maltz, who is a distinguished engineer at uh, Microsoft. He leads Azure's physical networking team. Uh, his team builds the software and network devices that. That, that connects uh, 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 you know, Microsoft's largest services, including the Azure Public Cloud uh, and Bing. Prior to uh, that, uh, uh, Dave was uh, at Microsoft Autopilot, and then before that, he had spent five years at MSR. And Dave has won the SICOM Test of Time Award, as well as the ACM Systems Software Award. Great, thanks, Ganesh. So uh, I'm here talking about the work of the Azure Physical Networking Team. We're called the Physical Networking Team because you might imagine we're in charge of actually getting packets between all the servers uh, inside of our data centers. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the environment in which we work. So we're building a really large network, hundreds of thousands of links of each data center, hundreds of data centers around the world. Um, you know, when you talk about large scale and large data sets, the network is very good at generating those kinds of things. And uh, just to be clear, the number one job for my team is high availability. It's making sure that every packet that gets sent by every service running in our network actually makes it across that network and received appropriately by the destination service. And the challenge we have is that at this large scale, the law of large numbers is not your friend. Yes, we see lots of nice median behavior, but it turns out nobody cares about what happens at the 50th percentile. People care about what happened at these strange edge conditions what is the very high nines percentile of your behavior, of packet loss, and everything else. 
And so instead of Occam's razor, where the simplest explanation is the most likely, you get Murphy's Law. There is something crazy happening in some part of the network that's going to generate really weird behavior. And my team's job is to go figure out what that is and stop it. So you take a network. This is actually sort of a shot of a rendering of, of one small part of our network in one small data center. You can see all the interconnectivity. And go find that proverbial needle in a haystack. And sadly, we're actually pretty good at it. But sadly, it does often take us quite a bit of time. And again, the time to mitigate these problems is also very important because our customers are suffering. They are bleeding money, reputation, and everything uh, while we go and try and find these problems and resolve them. So how can machine learning help us with this? So I'm going to have sort of a mixed message. I'm going to show you a couple of problems where I think ML probably has some things to offer us and we've been getting some benefits. I'm going to try and characterize some things where ML is probably not the best approach. And I hope I have enough time to end with a little bit of commentary about, from a practitioner's guide, if you're an ML person and want to work with system scientists or you're a system scientist and you want to work with ML people, how can you cross the knowledge gap between those two? I'll talk about sort of the three examples and I'll come back to sort of the, uh, the commentary text on the side uh, as we go through. Let me start with a problem called layer one topology generation. So the basic problem here is we want to keep our network from failing. We want to keep, say, our optical network from failing from various data centers or regions in our network being partitioned from the rest of the network due to fiber cuts or other fiber failures. Now you're like, hey guys, this is an easy problem. You tell me the availability distributions, time between failure, time to repair for your fiber, and we can predict what the availability and what you know, the, uh, uh, of any particular region should be. The problem is the following. Fiber providers, A, don't really know this information, and B, and if they, if they did, they're going to lie. And they're not really going to give us, as someone who's trying to acquire fiber to build our network, accurate information. And so the question is, given the fact that we have to acquire new fiber paths all the time to continue to, to build out and extend our network, we need to acquire enough fiber paths and the right kinds of fiber paths to hit the availability targets that we want. How can we actually predict what this time between failure and time to repair distributions are going to be for a new fiber path? Now, we have a large bunch of fiber paths already in our inventory. And so if we could take our experience that we've actually measured from existing fiber paths and figure out how to apply that to estimate the characteristics for new fiber, we could do a pretty good job. The challenge here is there are a lot and lot and lot of relevant dimensions. There's where the fiber goes. There's how many construction sites it goes through. There's how many people live along that fiber. There's how many kilometers are aerial fiber, how many kilometers are buried fiber. Lots and lots of other variables that can be extracted for each of these paths. And unfortunately, we don't want topology decisions or fiber path selection decisions to be made based on human emotions. There's, oh, we bought some fiber from this company last time, and they really like, were nice to us. We like them, so we should buy more fiber from them. Or I know this person who worked on that project, and they're very reputable, so let's buy. Right? That's not the right approach to this. So we've actually had some pretty good initial results in sort of this overall problem space. This is data from not exactly the problem I just described, but a very related one of trying to estimate what the availability of particular portions of our topology is going to be based on um, our estimated and then simulated data versus the actual availability. So the green bars represent our actual observed availability. The blue is the average of our simulated and estimated availability. And you can see in some cases we undershoot, in some cases we overshoot. We're doing a lot better than random chance here. And so again, that gives us hope that this is the kind of thing where classification algorithms can extract dimensionality that's not obvious to human being, that is still going to give us good business value. Is this ML? Is this statistics? Should we be using PCA or other kinds of straight stats versus more um, uh, uh, harder to explain classification algorithms? That's a really interesting conversation to have, and maybe we'll talk about it during the panel. Another problem, optical performance optimization. So we have what we call open line systems. Microsoft's actually been one of the companies out there driving towards this. Rather than buying a highly integrated system from one of the standard optical vendors where you have to buy all the equipment from them, we're trying to get to a disaggregated ecosystem where you can buy line systems and amplifiers from one company, transponders from another, and mix it all and match it together. One of the reasons is because these systems, when they, you open them up, actually have lots of parameters that we can tune to maximize the number of bits per second that can actually be delivered across any individual piece of glass. 
These are things like the transmit power, the receive power, how many uh, lamp amplifiers you put along the path, all of this kind of stuff. Is this a good machine learning problem? Okay, we've got a bunch of parameters and we want to set them appropriately. This is a control system uh, a problem in any one sense. Um, I'm going to argue no, this isn't. Why? Availability is our job number one, right? So I can't actually tolerate many of the errors that a machine learning system might put in due to misclassification or, or misestimation of the parameters. Two, I have a really good set. I have a physics textbook that more or less describes exactly the plant model of how this optical line system and all the amplifiers and power generation and noise and perturbations is going to work. So I can use much more standard control theory because I have that forward plant model to say, if I use this set of parameters, what's actually going to happen? What's going to happen to my signal? And I can then spin that loop as often and only when needed to try and tune the system. Okay? If you've got a, something where the physical layer is well understood, I don't quite see what we're going to use ML to try and do this, even though I do see a lot of people out there trying to use ML kinds of approaches uh, to this sort of problem. Third problem, network availability. Hopefully by now you can sort of see sort of where uh, the thinking is. Essentially, if you've got a really big data set, you've got the potential for machine learning problem. If what's underlying that big data set is a bunch of physical laws or properties that are well understood. You understand the interactions between all the variables. You're probably better off using standard control theory and some kind of forward plant model to drive your, uh, drive your system. If you're in a world where you don't even know which of these variables are actually salient or most important, you don't know which ones are going to be most descriptive in, in predicting the outcome, that's where uh, a bunch of machine learning types of algorithms can come up and actually help surface uh, uh, the, a much better model than any human being is going to come up with. Let's look at this last one, network availability. So again, let's talk about preventing failures. Now it turns out when you have a big complicated network like this, I have lots of redundant paths. If any device or link fails and actually shuts itself off when it fails, I am totally fine. The problem we have is what we call gray switch failures, where some piece of equipment actually starts dropping some small fraction of the packets that go through it, but not enough that it actually fails, stops, and takes itself out of service. When it stays in service while dropping packets, now it's a problem my team has to go through and find the device and shut it down. And there's going to be customer pain and impact until we do so. This really is the needle in a haystack problem. Again, we have lots of different data sources in part because we've tried many, many different approaches to this problem. So for example, we've set up ping meshes. We have all of our servers sending ping packets through the network and we're measuring latency and failure rates. We have pr targeted probe systems, which are actually you know, sending different types of probe packets of different kinds to try and simulate different or stimulate different behaviors. And we can target more probes onto links that we think are, might be dropping packets. Um, we've got error messages, basically debugging printfs that are coming back from the switches that may or may not indicate a problem on the switches themselves. We've got these end-to-end -end service health metrics, all the services running across the network which are telling us, I'm happy, I'm not happy, I'm getting worse, I'm getting better. Um, and essentially, the problem we now have is how do we combine all these things to localize the problem? We have a whole bunch of noise coming out of the best classification and recognition systems that we were able to build individually. And so this is now one of those meta-level things. One set of technology for this would be boosting. You know, how can we use boosting as a way to sort of pull more signal out of the noise being generated by each of these other smaller classification systems? We've also you know, used stochastic gradient descent and other kinds of algorithms uh, in a fault propagation model to try and work backwards to what is the most likely explanation for the set of symptoms that we're currently observing. But this, again, is a really rich and important area and something where, again, we have these large data sets. And sometimes they're pretty well labeled. We know whether the services were health, uh, healthy or not. Coming back to that final point about um, you know, a practitioner's guide, uh, I'm not a machine learning person. I am a, a networking researcher as well at heart. Um, and the thing I've seen the most is what we call the knowledge gap. There's some people who know machine learning and know the algorithms there really, really well. I've got a bunch of network scientists who know how ASICs work and how ASICs fail and how to look at service data. And the problem we have is when people are more interested in their own field than they are at solving the problem, these people can't talk to each other, or they just fail to talk to each other. And so, you know, for data science people who want to come work with systems people, I think the key thing is, you know, having to be, become more interested in solving the problem and learning more about the specific subject matter material 
then and even knowing in the classification algorithms in order to make forward progress, to basically establish what are the metrics, what are the salient dimensions, to be able to work through the data and sort through it to come up with better outcomes. And uh, I've experienced some positive examples of this. I've experienced some negative examples of this. And I'm glad to be part of this conversation here and, and talk more. So thank you. Questions? Okay. Yeah. Next up, we have uh, Keith. Keith is from uh, Stanford. Where he's an assistant professor. Uh, his research uh, is in network systems, and and uh, you know it, it mostly cuts across traditional abstraction boundaries and, and uses statistical uh, techniques. Keith, uh, you know, has won the uh, the the, the SICOM dissertation uh, award, and and uh, you know. And, and, and prior to being a professor, he was a, a staff reporter at the Wall Street Journal and uh, later worked at Case Plice, which was acquired by Oracle, where uh, he was the vice president uh, of product management and business development and, according to his web page, was also responsible for cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Keith. Thank you. I don't know which input I'm on. I think he's working on it. Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Um, I am not an expert in, in anything, but I was invited to be on this panel, so I'm going to do my best. Um, I, think, um, I think I'm going to agree with biology. Machine learning is good. Uh, and I think one thing I want to highlight is that when people say machine learning, they mean a bunch of different things. I think there's sort of maybe at least three paradigms in which we talk about using machine learning in the context of deploying an operational system. So paradigm one is, is what I'll call learn, then deploy. So you learn something, machine learning produces an artifact, you know, someone runs in a data center on a you know, million core GPU, all kinds of stuff. We produce an awesome artifact, uh, a learned network, and then we deploy that network. That's paradigm one. Paradigm two is about learning in real life. We, we deploy something and then we learn. We learn over time. Something's in the field, we learn. And paradigm three, I'm going to call we learn from the machines. Not the computer learning, but machine learning teaches us about our own thinking. I think these are sort of three different ways we could talk about machine learning in the context of network systems. And I, I guess I have sort of three different views. Paradigm one, which I think is currently the, the dominant one uh, people talk about, in my opinion, it's often harder than we expect. It's sort of not obvious, but it, it's often tricky. Paradigm two, this deploy and learn, the continuous learning in the field, I think is quite valuable, and I think we should, we should research it. But it's hard because of the nature of network systems. Uh, I think there's other domains where this is probably easier. But in networks, it's not so easy. And I think we should be working on those problems. And paradigm three, this idea that we can learn from the experience of teaching a machine to match us at some capability. I mean, that's a sort of old-fashioned, like, 1960s view. Uh, but I think it's still true today. I think we should uh, talk more on those terms. So I'm going to try and talk about it in that sense. So paradigm one, learn then deploy. Why do I say it's often harder than we expect? Well, I have been bit by this. So here's a paper uh, from me uh, that was at NSDI 2013 about a, a, a machine learning congestion control algorithm. It uses Bayesian reasoning for congestion control, the Sprout algorithm. Uh, and you can see on this graph, the best algorithms have the lowest delay and the best throughput. So the best algorithms are our algorithms, Sprout up and to the right. We're very proud of that. Now, what happens in real life? So we deployed this uh, around the world. And five years later, here's a result that was taken yesterday on the T-Mobile network in California. Same kind of graph. Here's Sprout. So still sort of up and to the right, but it's not really as dominant as we showed in our paper from five years ago. There's a whole bunch of other algorithms that are sort of on this Pareto frontier. That's in America. This is the same place we measured when we did our paper. How about here's a result that was literally this morning in New Delhi, India, on the Airtel network. Here's my algorithm. It's terrible. It sucks. Uh, can I say that here? I don't know a word. OK, thank you. Uh, so yeah, this learn then deploy. I learned. I wrote a paper about it. The paper won an award. I got a professorship. Now we learn in the field it doesn't actually work, at least not outside America. This is not a good paradigm for anyone other than me. I mean, I'm the beneficiary, but not everyone else. So uh, that's my algorithm. Here's a different algorithm, Vivace. This was published at NSDI 2018. Here's the publication again. Um, we see really good performance here, which shares the link as flows enter and leave. This is in the paper. Here's a result, again, this morning uh, in Brazil. Same algorithm, but again, it's quite different from the paper. We see the, the first flow sort of dominates, the second flow much less, the third flow much less. So there's a difference, again, between sort of the learn and then the deploy. 
Uh, here's a different paper. This is the Pensieve paper that was at SIGCOM, uh, the most recent SIGCOM. Excuse me. This is a learned scheme for deciding which video uh, bit rate to send a user over a network where there's unpredictability about the network and whether they're going to need to rebuffer and you want to have good quality video, but you don't want to run out of, of buffer. So this is in the paper. Uh, if you take the same learned artifact and you deploy it over similar networks, some students in my class tried and they got these results. Uh, so again, the learn, it, it works when you learn it, but later when you deploy it, something's different. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work anymore. And the only way to know this is to you know, teach a networking class where you can compel students to reproduce papers and then they have to do it. I mean, it, it's not actually easy to learn this information. I mean, we put a lot of effort into deploying this global infrastructure whose conclusion is that I was wrong. Uh, but if we, if we hadn't done that, we would never know. I would be going around blissfully talking about how great I was. Um, here's another one. So BBR, this is an algorithm from Google. This was published in ACMQ. And they say BBR converges towards a fair share of the bottleneck bandwidth. And at worst case, the oppositional algorithms might grab more than their fair share. BBR could have less than its fair share. That's the claim in the paper. Here is a slide presentation from RIPE76 just a few months ago. Uh, and the gentleman from APNIC finds that's just not true. Here's a cubic flow, and suddenly, when the BBR flow starts, it crushes the cubic flow. So there's learn. Google learned it. But then when you deploy it, you get something quite different. Um, so what they find is that BBR is not a scalable approach. You know, It works great when just a few users use it, like one big company, but not when you know, lots of people use it. Is BBR a failure? Not necessarily, because now there's going to be a BBR 2.0. You know, we'll see what happens. Here's another example. So network systems, sort of a broad field. Let's talk about search engines. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in using the data from search engines to learn things about the real world. Uh, and in 2008, Google had a paper about learning about the, the flu uh, from, the, from the search queries that they got. So the idea here is to learn a model to predict the real world flu incidents by correlating search engine queries against government flu data, which is released on a sort of uh, you know, two to three week time lag. They learn the model, and then they deploy it in real time to predict flu in advance of the government to help direct vaccines more efficiently. So this was on the front page of the New York Times, aches a sneeze a Google search. It was in Nature. It was on Charlie Rose. Uh, and they, Google put this plot on their website. And you can see the predictor, which is in blue, does really good against the uh, real life data, which is in yellow. This is, this is um, what they put on their website. What they don't show you is this. It's actually the vast majority of this plot is training data. So th this is what it is. But it's actually only a tiny bit of here it was not trained on. So this is hard. So they learned it on this uh, training data here. I mean, I annotated the figure. But then when they actually deploy it, this is not deployment. Uh, it's, I mean, they call it historical estimates, but it wasn't deployed historically. When they actually deploy it, this is what happens. It goes crazy. And we don't know why. Uh, Google eventually sort of, they kept trying to fix this. It kept screwing up. They eventually gave up on it. We don't know why this happens. I mean, maybe someone in the audience knows why. I don't know why. Um, Here's another example, spam filtering. And another sort of broadly construed network systems problem. Spam Assassin is a spam filtering engine. It has a very clever sort of community approach. The idea is anyone can propose a spam filtering decision rule. Uh, and it, it's OK because a central party learns the best weights for each of these rules, a sort of a panel of experts. So anyone can contribute a, a putative expert. People learn the best, essentially, they learn the best rates. So if your expert is sort of nonsense, they'll just give it a weight of 0. And if it happens to be very predictive, they'll give it a strong weight. And those weights are then deployed in the field. So in 2007, you know, people proposed various rules. Some proposed a rule. And the rule was, does the year match 200 and then any character, uh, you know, the date? And it turned out that caught a lot of spam, because a lot of spam is sent uh, for a date in the future, uh, like a date like 2012, which would have been in the future. So that would, would have been spam. So uh, this had an extremely low false positive rate when they learned it. People can see why, right? Because it's in 2007 that they're learning it. So what, what happened? January 1st, 2010, Spam Assassin started calling every message spam. So this is a sort of very easy to see case where the learn and then deploy, it just falls down in the real world. Because uh, you know, they had this idea that the algorithms were black boxes. They didn't have to know how they worked. They just looked at empirically how well they worked. And they weighted them according to their real performance. That did not work when time evolved. I mean, it's a very clear case here. If you depend on the date, as soon as you hit 2010, time's going to evolve. So what was the fix for this? How do you fix this problem? What was that? Well, they just changed it to 2020. That's their new decision rule. Yeah. So I, I think the lesson here is that it is very easy to fool yourself. And I think Feynman says, you are the easiest person to fool. 
This learn then deploy, it is a challenging par pattern. And empirically, very, very smart people and very, very smart mega corporations embarrass themselves going on television, two minutes, thank you, uh, you know, with premature declarations of success. So I think we have to keep that in mind. So paradigm two is sort of, okay, let's deploy and learn over time. We'll build systems that learn continuously and we'll directly observe the operational figure of merit over time. That way we can react quickly to real world changes. If the real world changes, just we just change. So some people are really good at this. So here's a paper from Google, the quick paper at SIGCOM last year. We see Google directly observes every day how well Quick is doing. And if there's a problem, they can immediately fix it. Whether it's automatic or them, they can fix it. This is really a world that I would want to live in. I would be very comfortable with deploying something crazy because you can see immediately how well it's doing. And not just sort of congestion control, but you know, in the real world, we do learn over time. If I'm driving a car and uh, something bad happens to me, I'm going to learn. I'm going to say, like, wow, I'm definitely not going to get that close to a Ferrari next time. Um, you want to learn over time. You don't want to just have a sort of fixed mindset and you know, do it continuously. If you build a robot to change a diaper and the baby sort of wriggles out of it, you want to learn from that experience. You don't want to be like, OK, I'm going to stay fixed. So this sort of continuous learning has some intuitive appeal, but it's hard. It's hard on a network. There are some classical results that make it hard in cases where information is distributed. So learning is much easier when all the information comes to one place. When information is distributed, it's really hard. And there's some old results that are therefore you know, profound that say that in some cases it's actually impossible. The impossibility of based group decision making with separate aggregation of beliefs and values. So if you keep the information apart, it's really hard to learn something consistent. It, you know, if you bring all the information to one place, you can do it. But if you keep the information apart, which is what we like to do on a network, we like to be de decentralized, uh, it's hard to do. So also, if agents are adversarial, it's very hard to handle this. You know, how do you handle competing agents? You know, one guy says, oh, I've learned this is best. I learned this is best. These are hard problems. They're hard network problems. They're problems we should work on. But they're not easy. Uh, Michael Shapiro and I actually have a conjecture that it's impossible for a decentralized congestion control scheme that, that greedily optimizes an objective function uh, to be globally asymptotically stable. That's, you know, it's an unproved conjecture. But it, it may be hard in these adversarial cases. How about in sort of neural networks? Do we have to just bring all the data to the cloud and learn there, or just learn in the edge? Wouldn't it be nice, my student John Emmons is working on this project, to s if the data and the compute are in different places, to still be able to learn without having to bring all the compute to the edge or all the data to the cloud? It would be nice to you know, sort of split the problem somehow and even learn continuously between data and the edge and compute in the cloud and learn between them. Uh, unfortunately, so far you can't do it. There's like a green region we want to be in, and we're not in there. So lesson two is sort of. Deploying learn can be great, but it's hard on a network when data is in different places, computes in different places, and people are adversarial. So I think to wrap up, the thing I'm most excited about is this old-fashioned view that the real benefit of teaching something to a machine is that you learn about that thing yourself. If we can tell the machine, design a system, and the machine comes, you know, here are my requirements, here are my goals, and the machine comes back and says, how about this? It, you know, it's better if it looks so weird. If we say, that's crazy, but huh, it does meet the requirements, and it does maximize the objective, that's very interesting. Let me clarify my thinking. That hmm is like the most exciting thing in science. So you know, teaching something is the best way to learn anything. The dumber the student, the better the teacher will learn, because you have to explain yourself so clearly. Machines are very dumb. So teaching machines to learn to design systems is the best way for us to learn about what it really means and what we really care about. So to wrap up here, I think paradigm one, it gets a lot of hype, but it is harder than we expect, and it is so easy to fool yourself. Paradigm two, I think we should be working on. I certainly am working on it. But the problems of network systems, the decentralization of data and compute makes it hard. And paradigm three, I mean, I'm quite sympathetic to it. I think even if we never deploy anything that's the product of machine learning, we should still do machine learning because we learn so much about the problem. So yeah, we had a sort of set of really interesting uh, perspectives on uh, the topic of this panel, so uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. I think uh, what I heard was, uh, you know, for problems of an inference nature, like I think uh, Baraji, you talked about this, and I think Dave, you also talked about it, where you're trying to figure out where the fault is in the network and you know uh, things like that. It's uh, obviously something that lends itself well to machine learning. I think Bruce, you talked about using data broadly, and Keith, you had very in interesting uh, perspectives on uh, different styles of applying machine learning. You know, I'd like to just start off with a question, and then we'll open the floor uh, uh, for uh, the audience to ask questions. I think networking people, by training, uh, are sort of like to be predictable, right? You know, uh, uh, the RFC specify what protocols must do, and you know, if if it's not a must, it's at least a should, right? If if such a message comes, this is what you should do. If there's a packet loss, this is what you should do, and so on. So, 
is there a cultural issue in adapting to a world where you don't have that predictability? You know, the, the data and the algorithm that you don't understand tells you something, and you're going to uh, op make decisions based on that. So y do you think there is a inherent tension there, and sort of there's a little hump that people need to cross to uh, get comfortable applying machine learning for more critical networking uh, decisions? So. I mean, the examples I, I talked about, there are well-known actual algorithms that do the job. Lasso, music, and this, the physics guys. Uh, I was saying there may be some, so for example, in the networking case, the neural network doesn't need to know the adjacency matrix because it's just a map, that uh, it's, it's hidden. That's an advantage. Uh, it doesn't need to know the nature of the noise. It's going to learn. So I think it's mostly that, you know, there's a certain, uh, uh, f the fact is that function is learnable. That really is most of the work that goes in establishing that fact. And then you try and, you know, uh, use a neural network to learn that function. And in the case of music, it wasn't straightforward. It really had to work quite hard. And so off-the-shelf stuff doesn't work. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't much doubt that the function is learnable. Because we know what the function is, and it's got continuous parts and lends itself just visually even to that it's learnable. Um, so I think that's one thing. But but this question of whether do you want data or models, the way you train these models, frankly, is you need data just to begin with. Um, much of what we did or anybody's doing, uh, it just requires these. Whenever you're trying to learn a function y equals f of x. You need a lot of x, x, i, y, i pairs, and then the function has to be you know, learnable. Uh, so that's really uh, what, what I've seen. So it's not. There may be some cases where you know the function has some very bad sort of Lipschitz sort of continuity properties, and then it may be difficult to learn the, those bits. But otherwise, you know, so far it's pretty decent. Yeah. So I, I, just, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I completely get the fu function approximation example, but uh, I was asking the question more broadly about making networking decisions. Yeah, in a way no, I understand. That, but, yeah, yeah so I, heard, I heard the question is one of, um, geez, if I have a system that I don't know exactly how it works, how do I have confidence that I could actually take action based on its recommendations and not make things worse? And here I'll go back to the adage, people have a tendency to screw things up, but to really make a big mess takes a computer. Um, so I am trying to hook up essentially machine learning and classification systems that are looking at data to automatic mitigation me mechanisms that will go in and change our network to try and fix problems. And that means is that if that system runs amok, it could actually go create a much bigger problem for our customers than, than what actually existed there organically uh, in the network. And so for us, it's been this combination of um, guardrails around the behavior of this feedback loop, essentially, so that no matter what the classifier says, it thinks it should turn off in order to mitigate a problem. Remember that great failure example? If I can find the switch I think is bad, I turn it off, everything gets good. But if I turn off all the switches, that's bad. Um, so, so putting guardrails around us, so we don't get kind of runaway behavior, and that if it looks like things are getting worse and worse, then we apply the brakes to the system and actually start rolling back some of the changes that were made. In my domain, at least, we have the ability to sort of create a closed feedback loop, and that's how we've approached it. Certainly, our system has recommended things to us that made no sense. And sometimes it was right, sometimes it was wrong. What, one of the things I like about <coughs> Dave's adage, to, to err is human, but to really foul things up requires a computer, is that it comes from the 1970s. <laughs> they, they already knew back then. Uh, but I, I, you, you know, when you talk about concerns about you know, whether we have a system whose behavior we don't really understand, I, I got to tell you, you're deluded if you think we understand how the systems we've been building work, okay? Uh, we already don't understand them. It's just a question of degree. Yeah. Um, I think it's a question of illusion. At least we thought we understood and so yeah. we felt comfortable. But, but, yeah. but going back a little bit to the specifics of your question, yeah, there's this cultural question, like do network engineers want to give up control to something they don't understand by a machine? But on the other hand, if you actually look at RFCs that say should and would, that kind of provides the framework and the more of that that's in the RFC, probably the better off you are because it says, okay, you're learning algorithm, it's only gonna have a few knobs it can change, and you have some hope you're gonna understand it. 
Um, so that, you know, that, that goes both ways. I think it's also this composition. Um, you can probably understand something at a single level. Uh, you know, it's like when, when you have packets here and then uh, there's protocols that are driving these packets and then they rely on the arrival of acknowledgements and that doesn't happen. Now something at this level triggers something at one level above that triggers something. Is that sort of, you know, it's almost like a F of G of H of K, you know, like, you know, you're sort of composing now. You only see the first thing and the last thing and you don't know where it's breaking. Uh, that sort of stuff is really hard. Right, uh, you can't isolate the fault very easily, and I think that's what frustrates us. Networking folks don't. We, we design with understanding, but unfortunately, we've composed things now, and they become big and complex. I, I, I think um, I, you know, there's sort of a sense where um, if something has only a small number of parameters. We thought that we understood it. You know, the, the AIMD algorithm in TCP, you know, you additive increase by one, divide by two, there's two parameters, and we wrote some nice proofs. And to then discover that actually the flock behavior of a decentralized network of, of computers running TCP, even with those two parameters, is incredibly complicated. Um, has all kinds of fun things that we discover. You know, it, it's actually chaotic uh, over drop tail queue, and it's uh, there's problems like incast that have to do with the sort of Packed by packet behavior that are not don't show up in fluid models. Um, so e even something with just two parameters, uh, when run in a decentralized network situation, is so fun but also so buggy. Um, that's a sort of fun and also humbling discovery. And I, I think there's an appropriate caution about deploying something with 100 million learned parameters. Uh, you know, if we can't even get the AI and the MD understand those dynamics, uh, you know, I, I think we should be appropriately humble about our ability to reason about a system w with a million parameters. And doing machine learning to optimize tail behavior or worst case behavior, especially in the presence of adversarial input, is an unsolved problem. Um, you know, it's one thing to optimize average case behavior of an image recognition program, but optimizing, I mean, we know that adversarial input to in, in, image recognition is actually like a, the adversary has the better hand there. You know, you can change one pixel and suddenly a, a, a puppy turns into the Sears Tower. Um, so it, it, the, I think there's an appropriate caution uh, about you know, increasing the number of parameters and, and, and defining the guardrails, which I think is such a good point. I don't think we know how to define the guardrails for many decentralized scenarios. I mean, how do you define uh, stability? Uh, how do you define a guardrail when you only observe part of the situation? Uh, I mean, these are fun problems that we should be working on, but I don't think we have the answers. I guess an interesting question is whether uh, adversarial attacks become more likely or less likely with a machine-learned system versus a handcrafted system. But I think I'll, uh, let's hold on to that uh, question. You know, uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Yeah, Keshav, uh, do we have microphones? Okay, good. Uh, thanks. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I, thanks for a really interesting set of talks. Uh, my question is sort of uh, more broadly about the no use of training data sets for machine learning, which is fundamental. And uh, obvious problem with such training data sets is that rare events are by definition rare. And the kind of control systems that you need to put into place for dealing with such events are not going to be uh, perhaps even available in the training data set. So this critical dependency on the training data set and the fact that these data sets may not include the cases that you care about mm -hmm. in practice makes uh, uh, reliance on machine learning only as your control system uh, you know, probably bad. I think that's a fair point. So the kinds of things that uh, are, in my examples, that we're trying to learn do actually happen a couple of times a day across the fleet. So they're rare, but they happen often enough that we actually have positive examples, and we can define a false positive, false negative rate on it. I still have to have human engineers on call 24-7, 365, because things will break that has never been seen before and that any of the automatic classification systems just don't know what to do with. And then we're back to good old human troubleshooting. Um, I, I mean, we've thought, toyed with the ideas of trying to actually inject, you know, when we have a partial forward plant model and can predict if this thing broke, what would it look like in terms of the symptoms we observe? Trying to eject more essentially synthetic failures into our training data, mixed success. Okay. 
Any other questions? Yeah, Tom. Back there. Um, I guess a, a question maybe following up on Keith's talk. Do you think there's a prospect for designing systems to be machine learnable? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and tell us how. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Low f systems with a with a without a lot of high frequency response are much easier to train a system for than ones that are very twitchy. Well, so I, I think you know, you know stability, slow evolution, and behavior over time. If you you know good network architecture, good system architecture, whether you're trying to have humans understand what's going on or an AI system understand what's going on. They're all easier to control. Yeah, I, I mean, we've, we've understood for a long time how to build congestion control protocols that don't need machine learning to yeah. operate well. We just don't build those systems. For whatever reason, we, you know, we use more complicated mechanisms for coordination than we really needed to, like just because Van invented an algorithm that we all have to live with now. <laughs> uh, and, and so there is this question, I think, of if we have designed for testability or designed for yeah. Uh, modular design for agility or whatever, do, do we need uh, a set of design principles for telling engineers how to build systems that can actually be predictable? Sure, I mean, I think they involve taking away the things that make the problem hard. So get rid of decentralization, get rid of adversaries, uh, the problem becomes much easier. Um, so, you know, a congestion control scheme where there is a central dictator that governs the allocation of everybody is much easier to reason about than a Van Jacobson style scheme where there's a partially observable Markov decision process that's solved in decentralized fashion. I mean, that is a literally an undecidable problem in general in computer science. So um, th that's why congestion control I is so hard if you do it decentralized. If you, if you bring all the information in one place and have a dictator make the decision, it becomes much easier. Um, but maybe the observation is, is that there, there are many of these kinds of tussles. For another one, it's not centralization, decentralized, but like you know, time to convergence mm -hmm. or efficiency and optimality. Sometimes giving up on some of those dimensions can actually get you a system that's going to be far easier to understand or far simpler. But that's, I agree. it is a trade-off. So maybe there's a, I mean, there's sort of an intuitive feeling that the more you squeeze the optimization lever in one place, all the other things are going to get worse. So if you squeeze for great average case performance, you know, probably your tails and your reliability and your adversary robustness, I mean, this is a very informal notion, are, are going to get worse. And maybe if we stop squeezing for the thing that gets you promoted, um, th th we'll all be happier. Or, or I mean, being less glib, may maybe if we somehow value these more harder to define metrics um, instead of just sort of average case performance or 95th percentile performance and stop squeezing so hard on that one. Uh, maybe, you know, understandability and stability, if we can quantify those, uh, we might be able to optimize for those instead. I think also in, in the world of algorithms, there's is better chance, subsystems, there's more chance of this being very helpful just because it's very clear and uh, it's got an easier definition of what, if this input arrives, I want, you know, this is a desirable output. I think that there you can see success. I think it seems uh, to be that you know one of the requirements is a good telemetry system that actually gives you the data that mm -hmm. you need from actual deployment, right? I mean, I think you know search engines did a great job because you know they had all the data and sort of they knew exactly what users were clicking on and so on. Whereas uh, networking systems, I don't think a lot of data comes back because it's all over the place and it's expensive to bring it back. So I think that's a, a challenge. Uh, I think we have just a couple more minutes, so. Uh, I want to ask uh, a final question. Uh, oh, Ganesh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's fair to say that overall, you know, the whole systems and community and networking community has a, you know, a cautionary approach to infusing ML uh, into the whole uh, the mix. Uh, you know, and it's fair. You know, a lot of reasons were brought up in all the presentations. Venkat outlined it as well. My question is to the panelists: Is do you see any sub areas of systems and networking? where we would actually be better off if we, you know, lowered the caution bar and, you know, and then these systems could evolve faster and for the better. I understand it's not all the sub areas, but any specific sub areas you could think of. How about the scheduler, the branch predictor, you know, those kinds of things? 
And, and why is it, do you think, that uh, you know, lowering the caution bar in those is better than, say, I don't know, congestion control or something? I, I think there, those are examples, perhaps, where when there is a, a when the, the when there's a misprediction, the cost isn't so high. Now, David, he's worried about individual packets being lost. That's not the right case. Then you might not want to do it. But if it's just a question of, well, it's just going to cost us a little more, but we get the same performance, or it's a microscopic change in performance, you don't need to be as cautious. Right? And that's a low-hanging fruit. Especially, and you may not need to know why it made the decision. Because if it's wrong, it didn't cost you that much. There's totally no way that I couldn't use quirks of a branch prediction algorithm and, and speculative execution to steal information out of a process running. That would totally <laughs> never work. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm not sure it would be worse if you used a neural network, though. I mean, how about the, yeah. query, the query planner in a database? I mean, I think these kinds of things, I, I don't have any. We're already using sort of folklore methods, so why not use a neural network? OK, so I think we need to close, but I just want to take you know, 30 seconds each. Just uh, you know, usually you ask people to predict the future, but I'm going to change the question here. <laughs> if you had the machine learning technology and horsepower that we have today in the 80s, when you know, congestion control took shape, or in the 90s when you know, BGP was designed, or you know, may maybe in the 2000s when firewalls and uh, deep packet inspection and so on came to the fore, how would things have been done differently that would perhaps make us better off today? You know, if, if you had to redesign things with the machine learning technologies available today, what would have happened differently? Just quick. Uh, okay, I can go first. But I'm just going to take the example of this music thing. Uh, it learns the environment. So you, you come out of, off the shelf with an algorithm that works in many environments fairly well, but not optimized for anything, can't be. And then you deploy in a particular, like in your indoor home area, you've got some VR headset. That thing really works differently in the basement room versus here, this money's work. Well, I think that's an example of something where Adaptive. Yeah, adaptive okay. to, to the environment. Okay. I, I think that if we'd had this horsepower in the 80s, I would have been able to say, okay, Google, why is the network so slow? And it would say, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing it's good at, right? It's recognizing patterns. It can understand my, my question, but it doesn't know the answer. <laughs> Anyone else? Congestion control, Keith, you should be able to. Okay, fine, congestion control. The, tr the truth is that people have been talking about congestion control in the context of machine learning for since it started. I mean, Keshev's paper on packet pair it talks about the then prevailing paradigm of machine learning, which was fuzzy logic. Is that, that's right, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all about fuzzy logic, which was the, the hype thing in you know, the early 90s. I bet, if, I bet if deep neural networks had been around then, you would have written the exact same paper, but you would have subbed out fuzzy logic for neural networks, but nothing would have changed about the algorithm. So I, I, I don't know. OK. Dave, last word? Yeah, I'm not really coming up with one either. The one thing I do know is whenever Skynet tries to take over the world, it will probably crash because of a networking problem. <laughs> <laughs> OK, on that note, let's thank our panel again. Thank you.